and we're live. Okay, so uh, welcome back to those who are familiar with the Beauvoir webinar series and welcome to those who are attending for the first time. According to the registration poll um, form, it's the first time for 50% view. Uh, of course, we are excited to have you to end up for it. it is the first time for 50% of you. I would like to briefly introduce the Beauvoir webinar series just for you to have the context uh, of the, um, the, the event. So this event uh, session is part of the Beauvoir webinar series, which is a project that Gina Opiniano and I have been organizing for uh, the International Simone de Beauvoir Society since 2020. And if you're interested uh, in Simone de Beauvoir, you might want to take a look at um, the, 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 the former sessions. We had nine sessions so far, and today is number 10. So this is uh, great. We are really happy uh, about it. Uh, here's the list of the sessions. All of them have been recorded. So it means that you can watch them online if you're interested. For that, you can visit directly uh, the website of the Society, where you will find a, a section dedicated to the Beauvoir webinar series. Or you can also visit our YouTube channel. Um, the name is uh, Beauvoir Society. Uh, I just want to remind you that it is possible for you to join the Society, to become a member of the Society. And it would be a huge support for us and also for the journal, Simone de Beauvoir Studies. Uh, because when you become a member, you also get a subscription to the journal and uh, member are also registered on our mailing list. Uh, but of course, you can follow uh, our activities on social media, just like Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. Um, anyway, it, this is just a, a way to remind you that the society exists. And the message is that being a member of the society means also being a part of a large community of people who share common interests. So you are very uh, welcome to join us uh, if you'd like to. Uh, one more thing, we are not just online. Uh, once a year, we organize an international conference and this year's conference is organized by our president, Erika Runakowski and her team. Uh, it will take place in Helsinki in August and the topic is Beauvoir and post-truth. So it is very uh, interesting. The program will be out very soon, so make sure you don't miss it. Uh, we will share it on the website and then um, on the, our mailing list and on social media. Um, now let's come to what brings us together today, uh, Beauvoir's theory of literature and this, its contemporary relevance. That's what the session will explore from the research and perspectives of two important specialists, Tori Moy and Ashley Shu. Uh, we wanted to do a session on the subject in light of many perspectives opened by recent research and publications. I'm thinking in particular um, of the English translation in 2020, uh, thanks to Alice cafarel queron of Beauvoir's What Can Literature Do? It was translated by Chris Fleming in the Journal uh, of Continental Philosophy. I'm also thinking of the recent publication in paperback of the Beauvoir series, and especially the volume dedicated to literary texts, um, which was an important publication in English. Um, of course, I'm also thinking of Les Inseparables, Inseparables uh, a recently published text by Beauvoir that I think will give rise to new work. And by the way, we did a session on the subject with Claudia Boulian, who is here, I think, today, uh, with Civil Le Bon de Beauvoir, uh, and Francis Walsh. Um, and there's also the work of linguist Alice cafarel queron on Simone de Beauvoir's control of language and literature, which is fascinating. And also other work on uh, the reception of Beauvoir's work on her relationship with uh, the readers and with communication. So I invite you to consult the journal Simone de Beauvoir Studies to realize uh, the richness and diversity of authors and research on the subject. Um, so in light of all of this, organizing um, a session on the topic seemed uh, necessary and we wanted very much to do so. So we have invited two scholars whom you probably already know uh, and I'm going to introduce uh, them to you. So Tori Moy is a James B. Uh, Duke Professor of Literature and Roman Studies. Uh, she's a professor of English, Philosophy and Theater Studies 
and the director of the Center for Philosophy, Arts and Literature at Duke University. Among her groundbreaking publications are numerous works on Simone de Beauvoir and feminist and literary theory, um, just like sexual textual politics, feminist literary theory published in 1985. Uh, there's also Simone de Beauvoir, The Making of an Intellectual uh, Woman, uh, which was also translated into French. Uh, it was originally published in 1993. And of course, What is a Woman and Other Essays in 1999. So thank you for being with us today, uh, Toriel. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. Um, Ashley Shu is an assistant professor of French at Eckerd College. She received her PhD in French from Duke University in 2011. So she and Toriel know each other very well, if I'm not mistaken. You've worked together. Uh, Ashley's dissertation examined the contribution of Simone de Beauvoir to philosophical literature. It can be read online if you're interested. Her teaching and research interests are in French language, French literature, philosophy, uh, French existentialism, and feminism and women writers. So welcome, Ashley, and uh, thank you for being part of this event today. Uh, their conversation will be moderated by Marguerite Lacaze. Marguerite knows perfectly well the recent uh, scholarship on Beauvoir because she's the book review editor of the journal Simone de Beauvoir Studies. And she's also an associate professor of philosophy at the University of Queensland in Australia. Her research interests include European philosophy, feminist philosophy, moral psychology, and especially the emotion and aesthetics, including philosophy and film. And um, if I'm not mistaken, she's currently working on a project on Beauvoir and cinema. And maybe you can, maybe you can uh, talk about it later. So welcome Toril, Ashley and Marguerite. We are delighted to have you today. I hope you will enjoy the conversation and I know I now leave the floor to Marguerite. Thank you so much, Marguerite, for moderating the conversation. Oh, thank you, Maureen. It's really a delight to be invited and really fantastic to be able to talk to Ashley and Toril and everyone else. Yeah, so I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country because it's a tradition here in Australia that you acknowledge the Aboriginal lands that you're on. And so I'd like to acknowledge that I'm meeting you from the land of the Turrbal and Jagera people. And so they're here in Brisbane, in Mianjin, and I'd like to acknowledge the elders of the Turrbal and Jagera people, past, present and emerging. And so we've got some questions, but what we thought that we would do is that we would um, sort of if something interesting comes up, then we'll sort of follow that, pursue that a little bit further so that we will allow the conversation to flow a little bit. And but I'd like to begin with a couple of questions for um, I'll start with Toral first. And what I was really wondering about is how did you first discover uh, Simone de Beauvoir's work? And what was it about her writing that really captured your attention? Well, it goes back, so I shouldn't reveal when this happened because uh, it's a very long time ago. But when I was like maybe 15 in Norway, they translated excerpts from the second sex. Um, this must have been, I know it was published on the 8th of March in possibly 1970, thereabouts. And but 8th of March, International Women's Day. And I remember running out to buy this two volume, but tiny book. It maybe contained a third of the original, but I didn't know that then, nor did I speak any French. So there was it was the Norwegian version or nothing. I suppose there was the English translation, but you couldn't get hold of that in my little village in Norway. So and I read this thing and it changed my life. It made me see that there was a way to find a language for what I saw around me in the countryside in Norway. Lots of women who had no work outside the home or they were working on farms. And then of course they worked, but they were still sort of in the home. Um, and also just what I read in the papers about her, it seemed to me that here we had a woman who spoke from a place of freedom that I couldn't even articulate back then, but I knew I wanted that thing. And it was totally instrumental for my choice to begin 
when I went to the University of Bergen in Norway, I decided I had to begin by studying French. I had no idea even that one had to read literature to study French. I just knew that I had to learn French so I could read everything Simone de Beauvoir had written. And so I think for me, it was freedom, a way of living that was different. She gave me a sense of there being a wider world out there that could have a place for women. And that's always remained with me. Mm -hmm. And that's wonderful, Toral. That's an amazing story. That's really great. I was sort of, I think I might ask you more and more questions, but I might ask Ashley as well and see if we can draw some threads together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the first thing that I read by Beauvoir was in college. Um, and I read The Woman Destroyed for uh, one of my lit courses. And I remember that I actually hated it. <laughs> so that first experience, I, I didn't, quite get it. I thought it was depressing, you know, how, how upset she was about her husband and all these things. Um, thankfully, in graduate school, I had uh, another course on Beauvoir entirely with Toral. Um, and in that course, I started to see what I really fell in love with in Beauvoir's work, which is the way in which she really weaves her philosophical ideas into lived experience into into accounts of lived experience and so for me that was really really exciting um, because I found you know purely abstract conversations to be dry and it didn't really it didn't I didn't see why that mattered to me and to my life but I also found literary works that didn't really get at bigger questions to be um, not interesting at all either and so what she was doing was she was really showing how these big questions and these big ideas can color our lives. And she says things like, you know, there's no difference between philosophy and life. And that's the way that she writes. And that was the thing that really grabbed me in her work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really interesting because that actually connects to our theme for today. And I wonder if perhaps a follow-up question for both of you is then, is it something particularly about Beauvoir's literature that became really important to you? Because you were sort of suggesting that, Toral, when you said when you had to study French, you didn't realise you would need to read literature. So I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. Well, of course, when I studied French back in the day, we had no women teachers, except there was one adjunct teacher who was a woman whom they never gave a permanent job to. And she taught a course on French women writers for one semester. But of course, Simone de Beauvoir, uh, just wasn't taught. Uh, we didn't, uh, discovering her as a literary writer came, I had to do that on my own, you know. But uh, I think I was just so thrilled that she had written novels and even a play and I read it all. And to start with, it was much more about understanding what she was doing. I would have read whatever genre she operated in. Had she written in haikus, I would have read that. So I, and also I always loved reading novels. So the, the first novel that really struck me when I sat down and then I was probably a grad student, I had read it before, but when I really sat down to study L'Invité, it really struck me as such an ambitious philosophical novel. Um, and yeah, that, that was very striking to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's really interesting. You both talked about the connection between uh, philosophy and literature. And so one of the things I thought was really interesting about um, this session is the idea of Beauvoir as a literary theorist is a really kind of fresh idea. And so, but I thought it might be good if we talked a little bit about just the idea of literary theory, like how did that come in for you as well? And how do you conceive it? Maybe Ashley, you're nodding quite a lot. Sure, there. yeah. I mean, for me, literary theory in, th in this context is really a questioning of like, why do we write literary texts? Um, what distinguishes them from 
other genres, from other types of writing? And what is their purpose in the world? Like, why are they out there? Um, and, and, and how do they help us? Um, I, th I think that it's also related to the study of aesthetics. So like that kind of broadens the question out to other forms of art. Um, what is what is art for and why does it help us? Why do we, why is it valuable to us? Um, which is a question that I think is being asked a lot of us as teachers of the humanities right now, right? Like, why should we be doing this? Shouldn't we just be studying STEM and, and not worry about these kinds of questions? Um, so it's a really, it's, it's close to my heart, the answer to this question as to why this is valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's really good to bring out that just a sort of reflection on the whole process of literary writings and other aesthetic works. Did you want to say something about us, that as well, Toril, about yes, literary because, theory? Yes, because my first book, as you said, was Sexual Textual Politics, subtitled Feminist Literary Theory. And for that book, which I wrote in the, it published in 85, I finished it in 1984, can you imagine? And I had this pet idea that I wanted to write something on Beauvoir as a literary theorist for this book. The whole reason I wrote that book was that I wanted to know feminist theory and there were no books on it, but I needed it so my next book could be on Simone de Beauvoir. That was like, that book was a detour towards Beauvoir. But the point here was that I realized that back then when we were just, we were coming out of new criticism, getting steeped into post-structuralism and écriture féminine and all these things, um, I couldn't write on Beauvoir as a literary theorist, I couldn't figure out how to do it because my frame of thinking was in a place that simply can't do justice to what she's doing. And then over the years, um, and you know, as you all know, because you're Beauvoirien, um, <laughs> there was not a lot of enthusiasm for Simone de Beauvoir as a thinker in the high at the high point of French theory and écriture féminine. There's a lot of writing on that. But at the same time, although I admired her, I had those instruments with which to think. And so I couldn't write about her as a literary theorist. I simply couldn't see the literary theory. And then um, I kept working on theory and literature and philosophy over the years. And then one day I saw it. I was, you know, I've, I've been teaching this seminar that Ashley mentioned, and I keep teaching it, and then that gives me an opportunity ever, ever so often to reread key texts, and suddenly I realized what was going on, and so now I can say, by literary theory, I understand, first of all, very classically, ideas about text readers and writers, their relationships, how they relate to each other and so on. And of course, one aspect of that would be the relationship between literature and philosophy, which is something that a writer and a reader has to bring to the text in, in some way. But then I realized that Simone de Beauvoir, particularly in literature and metaphysics, but also in Capula Literature, she actually is writing about something that only became really foregrounded in literary theory these last 20 years, maybe. I mean, it was there before, but not in this way. She was writing about reading, her understanding about what it is to do literary theory, not that she would have used that term, it's anachronistic for the 1940s, of course, um, she uh, in France in that way, but it really is about how the reader must take up a text and how the author has to, as it were, reckon with the reader. And since in I had moved away from post-structuralism, read a lot of Wittgenstein and Cavell, I suddenly realized, ah, well, of course, this is all about writing as Beauvoir's key term would be the appeal, the appel, and uh, it's about readers 
being willing to follow the writer on her adventure, as Beauvoir says, and suddenly it fit with a lot of ideas about reading as immersion versus reading as suspicion and so on, that I just didn't manage to discuss in the 1980s. But, but now we can, and I felt it was like a breakthrough when I published that finally published my piece on Que peut la littérature, which goes back to before it was translated into English, because the piece had languished, no one read it, including me, as it were, I had read it, but couldn't do anything with it, and suddenly I could, and I think that shows that the understanding of what literary theory is had also changed by from the 80s to the 2000s, so I, and now I think it's about how among other things, how a text speaks to us and how we respond to it, how we acknowledge it, to put it that way. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great, Toril. That really brings up quite a few of the themes that we want to bring out, the idea of the appeal and the importance of the reader. And I did want to ask this question, though, which you actually touched on in what you were saying, because just thinking about the whole history of Beauvoir sort of not wanting to be called a philosopher, I was thinking, are we sort of doing it again in trying to call her uh, a literary theorist? And you were saying she probably wouldn't have thought of herself that way. But I wonder what, what she, she would think about us drawing out these aspects of her thought. Maybe Ashley, uh, you might like to say something about that. Huh. I mean, I, I think that um, she, when she said that she didn't want to be called a philosopher, I've thought a lot about that, right? That like for her, she felt kind of torn between the two. She would say that, you know, she would read these philosophical works and, and think, why, why would I ever want to, you know, do anything else? And then she would read literature and she would see these ideas being tied to everyday life. And she would think, well, this, this is what I want to do. And so she talks a lot about trying to find what she called like an intermediary voice, something that was kind of in between the two. Um, and so I think that that was why she didn't want to be called a philosopher because she wanted to be something that was not in, in, in fully in writing the system kind of setting. Um, would she want to be called a literary theorist though? Um, that I haven't, I hadn't really thought about. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, she she would want to be called first and foremost, uh, you know, a, a novelist. Um, but within those novels, she's doing a lot of work where she's thinking through what what is what is the novel, what is it, its value, and and how does it what kind of relationship does it create between people? Um, and I think that she really builds an ethics that that is grounded in the sense of the ideal literary relationship that's one where it's like a privileged place of inner subjectivity um so yes i don't know I, I really don't know how she would respond to me calling me saying that that makes her a literary theorist but um i think that she's doing it at any rate mm -hmm. yeah i agree mm -hmm. with i do agree with that i think that I think Wellick and Warren's big book theory of literature was published in the late 40s. And I actually think there was no field called literary theory back then. <clears throat> the, the theory de literature, I don't think anyone said that in France in the 40s. So therefore, I think we're off the hook. I think it's like, she definitely does it, I agree totally with Ashley. And we would call it literary theory, but maybe they would just call it reflections on literature or something like that back mm. then. I mean. mm. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting, like just sort of bringing out the thoughts that are there. And that actually, I think leads us just really well. You already mentioned that, Toral, that you wrote this essay on what can literature do, Simone de Beauvoir as a literary theorist before... Um, her essay was translated into English, which was only fairly recently that it was. And in there, you talk about that li Beauvoir's literary theory centers on a couple of key ideas on speech acts, on the voice um, and identification. And you were saying that she kind of goes against the tide of the times in the way because there was a sort of form of uh, formalism that was um, quite prevalent then. And I think you were suggesting that 
as um, as time has gone by, perhaps there's a more open reception for Beauvoir's way of thinking. But I was wondering, could you just say a little bit more about those concepts that you drew out of Beauvoir's essay? So, yes, I mean, the, luckily my piece is still available and short and it's a quick read if anyone wants to go deeper into it. So I'll just say a few things. But first of all, I was very struck. I like to historicize and look at the situation in which someone speaks or writes. And what was stunning about Que peu la littérature is that it was Beauvoir's contribution to this, to a, edited volume that was based on this big meeting at the Mutualité in, in Paris, where there were, there was Beauvoir and Sartre, and I think saint pa anyway, a communist. And then there were three people who were much less famous then, but who were connected to a journal that was going to just come into fashion, namely Tel Quel. And so it was the moment where Sartre had been given the Nobel Prize in Literature that year. I think this meeting was when he would have been in Stockholm to pick it up had he accepted it, which he did not. But um, it, for me, historically, it's almost like a tipping point. The 20 years after the war, Beauvoir and Sartre had been the... The, held the maximum symbolic capital in the French system. And now it's about to turn, and we know what happens then, that the new héritier, the new crown princess, will come in and try to undo the symbolic capital, the power of the previous generation, and this is what happens. So that Beauvoir's ideas about literature in 1964 were in a sense perfectly consonant with what she does back in the 1940s. It's just that the tide will turn and everyone will be supremely formalist and structuralist for the next 20 years. <laughs> so, um, so there she talks about, yeah, I think it's Jean Ricardou who had introduced in that debate a distinction between what he calls information and what he calls literature. And Beauvoir says, well, information and literature, her answer is fascinating to me. Her, she says it can't possibly just be a matter of form because, you know, she mentions um, an important book in anthropology that's written as dialogues and so on. You can have all kinds of academic journalistic work that is uses all kinds of genres. So it can't be just formal. It has to be something else, she says, and that's something else she calls a voice. There has to be a voice that speaks to me. And of course, if you're interested in speech act theory and in Wittgenstein, you realize that, well, that's the point. There's always someone who speaks. The act of speaking reveals who you are and addresses the other. So speaking then becomes a dialogue. And that is what it is for Beauvoir, because then it becomes an appeal to the other who is supposed to be, if, as she says in many places, if the novel works, you can be immersed in it. She she really talks about that feeling of passionate immersion in a book that became so unfashionable with a certain kind of structuralist reading. Because if we said, oh, I was totally, I couldn't put it down, then it meant that we weren't thinking critically and we couldn't possibly say that at some po point. But Beauvoir is uh, uncompromising in a sense that the advantage of thinking of literature in that sense is that it shows you the world as seen by another human being. And that's how we get to, to Ashley's point that there is such a, an effort in Beauvoir to say that we are separated. We, uh, we suffer from human finitude as it were. We are alone, we, are, we will die alone, but we can connect with others and we can do it particularly 
if there is such a thing as a genuine voice showing you in their book how they see the world, then you can actually, as it were, she calls it identify, but it's not the usual notion of identification. She says, you can come to almost imagine that you occupy their space from which they see without losing your own. So suddenly there's access to the, the, the point of view of the other there. And that's philosophically very interesting as well as, um, as just literarily as it were. I think I'll stop there. I mean, that's mm -hmm. some of the stuff that I find fascinating. Because mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. all, this gap between self and other, not only is it Beauvoir's big theme, but we live in and still in an age of skepticism where we tend to think, oh, I can never understand what others really think, or others are opaque to me or something. And Beauvoir says, if the writing is good enough and strong enough, you can come to see what that person sees. I think it's a, a sophisticated reflection on the problem of skepticism, which of course she writes a lot about in her novels as well, Glambite, for example. Ashley, I'll, I've said more than enough now. Yeah, Actually, I that mean, is... Oh, go ahead. Oh, well, I was just thinking just on that point that Toro was bringing out there, the idea that um, Beauvoir um, thought about the idea of communicability of her thoughts. So she wasn't um, sort of doubting that there would be this possibility of understanding, but that might not have been the point that you wanted to pick up on. Well, no, I did. It, it was really, it's really fascinating to read that Coupe la Literature, um, like all the contributions to that conference, because when you get to Beauvoir and Sartre, both of them seem really, really frustrated um, with the ideas that they're hearing and that they, they seem to be insisting on the possibility of communication. And they seem to be thinking that the other theorists who are contributing to this conversation don't seem to see literature as being a privileged place for intersubjectivity, as they like to argue that it is, right? That they don't seem to see that there's that possibility for connection, that you know, words have so many different ty types of interpretations and we're never gonna come together and actually share something in that space. And um, Beauvoir in particular, I think Toril has kind of hit on this already, is trying to say that well, yes, there are certain ways in which we are irremediably separate, right? That, you know, we're, we're going to, you know, our death is our own and um, no one else can really have the full taste of our life. But that doesn't mean that we can't share these spaces. We can't create these spaces where something is communicated. Um, and that space in, in the literary text, she keeps talking about it like a space too, right? She says it's a world, right? And you enter into it. Um, and so when you share that space, you still are understanding something of the other while while keeping something of yourself. Yeah, um, I want to I want to continue with that because you put that so well, Ashley. The, the whole the whole point is that she talks about what she calls identification as not at all about I recognize myself in this. You know how we talk about identification nowadays? It's often, oh, there are characters that I can see myself in. That's not what she means at all. She means exactly what Ashley said, which is imagine the writer as located almost as a specific location in space, like longitude and, and latitude, and there they are. Now, they show me what they see from that point, that point. And then I can sort of take up a position in that point and see it too, but without, of course, being them. I'm not them, but they can show me what they see from their point of view. And I think that that is so valuable to overcome the sense that it, it fits Beauvoir so well, because it overcomes this sense that, oh, unless you write about characters who are like me, then I can't understand the book or the book is then excluding me. No, it's an act of invitation to you to come and see, can you follow me to this spot and see what you see? It doesn't follow that you like what you see or anything, but it is an opportunity to take another look at the world as someone else saw it. And I like that spatial metaphor. I'm very glad you brought that out, Ashley. 
Yeah, and I, I just going off of that, the thing that I'm working on right this moment, an article that I'm trying to write, um, I'm talking about an experience that I'm having with my students in gen ed classes. Um, and the experience is, you know, when we're talking about Plato, for example, they and I ask them to role play, like, you know, what would Plato say to this? They have no problem. They throw themselves right into it, right? But if I if it's James Baldwin or Audre Lorde, if the author is Black, Suddenly I get this response over and over again, which is I couldn't possibly understand what that would be like um, from my majority white students, right? But so I, I'm talking about the majority in the classroom. And I think a lot of that is just a misunderstanding of what I'm asking of them, right? Like I'm not asking them to try to be James Baldwin or to take over his <laughs> position. I'm asking them to imagine from what he's put out into the world, what they think he would say, like how, to, to to try and recreate the world from that point of view. And um, I think it has a lot of implications for the way that we're talking about books um, and, and whether or not we should be able to enter into these spaces. Um, so that's that's something that I'm working on right now. Mm, mm. That's really interesting. Um, that might be a good time for us to just think about this idea of the appeal. So you've written about that, Ashley, that that's mm -hmm. a really important idea. I thought that was really nice the way you discussed that it sort of gets away from this dilemma of the book being sort of too philosophical or not being philosophical enough, but you use this idea of the appeal of Beauvoir's that she isn't presenting just a philosophical point of view, but rather she's she's sort of alerting us to all the ambiguities about it. So I was wondering, could you say a bit more about that? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that um, for her, when you write a literary text, you don't have an argument in mind. It's not, so, you know, I'm not going to say something about, say, skepticism. And that's, you know, this it's this particular thing that I want the reader to come away with it. Um, it's more an exploration of how that question can color our lives or how that question can complicate our lives. Um, and so that really is what she calls the appeal. It, 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 it's really grounded in that ambiguity because different characters live the question differently. A lot of times it's contradictory. It's hard to figure out um, what you're supposed to take away from it. And so that is what she would call an appeal to your freedom. Um, it's really inviting the reader in to take that up and to interpret it and to put their own meanings into it as well. Um, and so I think that the appeal, it almost works in the same way as freedom and situation works, right? You're not forcing a certain interpretation of the world world onto somebody, but rather you're giving them a picture of the world and then they have to look at that and decide what it means. Um, so thinking back to the idea of the situation as the, the rock that Sartre talks about, right? Like if you walk up to it and you see it, it could be part of a beautiful landscape or it could be an obstacle because I'm trying to get through, right? So good literary works will kind of give you enough ambiguity that you have to make a choice between different ways of seeing it. Um, and I think that her best works for me are the ones where I kind of get myself tied up in knots trying to figure out the meaning, right? Like I'm going back and forth and I'm saying, well, it could answer this question this way, but it could also answer it in, in a different way that seems completely contradictory. And I love that. Like it just, it feels really exciting to me. And I think that it's it's asking me to do a lot of work that I think is is fun, to mm -hmm. be quite honest. Yeah. Yeah, so that's really interesting that idea oh sorry Toral, but yeah, yeah I, I just, just I just wanted to say be at this point before I forget it it's in mm -hmm. the because Ashley mentioned freedom um and mm. there's obviously much more we can say on freedom and the appeal I mean we could say much more for years about Beauvoir but the the I wanted to mention a very interesting book, which also considers Beauvoir as a literary theorist, namely Yiping Ong's The Art of Being, 2018, which um, is not a book in Beauvoir's scholarship per se, because she's writing, it's really theory of the novel, or I'm not quite sure what comparative literature and theory of the novel, 
but uh, the author is Yi Ping Ong, I'll put it in the chat, um, The Art of Being, and what she said, what she is interested in, she's really writing about 19th century novels, but she turns to Beauvoir, and particularly literature and metaphysics, if I remember it correctly, um, to say that what Beauvoir wants from the reader is that the reader should engage their freedom in following the author on their adventure. And this entails responsibilities on both sides. Of course, the author can let you down, as it were, you, or you can fail to, ri to rise to the author's demands on you. But having said that, she says that one way of say, of seeing what Beauvoir is doing when she says novels can be philosophical, but they mustn't just illustrate a philosophy. I mean, everyone agrees that that's not a good idea. Uh, is Yi Ping shows that it's really about creating characters who give the illusion of being free. That's so that you don't feel they're puppets for the author. Because the moment you feel there's a string pulling, which of course has to be an illusion because there's a writer and there is string pulling, right? There's no way you're not manipulating your own characters. But all writers say, oh, at some point the character takes over and so on. But, but it's this moment where the reader can get into the character here. Yeah, particularly characters since she's writing about 19th century novels where they are really crucial, um, that the character feels like they're free to you. And when I thought about that, I think that the piece by Beauvoir that best illustrates that, which is a thought that is actually this section on Stendhal in The Second Sex, where she talks about the freedom of Stendhal's women characters. So that, uh, so in any case, I don't think Yi Ping Ong mentions that bit, but it's worth thinking about how it is that you have to even not just see the act of writing as an act of freedom and an appeal to the writer, but according to Beauvoir, the, at least if you're doing philosophical literature, you have to somehow convey the freedom of the characters, or we will immediately see roman à thèse. We can't have that, you know? So, yeah, that's just to follow up on the freedom point and, and to mention that really interesting chapter in Yi Ping Ong's book. Mm. And is that how you see the freedom, Ashley? Is that what you had in mind when you were talking about freedom, do you think, partly? Yes, I do. And I, I think to Beauvoir builds this idea of the artistic freedom through her characters and her novels too. So her characters and her novels, um, for example, are looking out onto the world and kind of creating these, like layering these meanings onto the world or really just seeing the meanings as being um, I'm looking for the good word for this, but it's like almost like imbricate, imbricated into the world, like they're they're part of the world. And but that's really a free act, right? It's an act of their freedom. They're remaking the world. She talks a lot in her literary theory about how when you write a text, you're remaking the world. And I think it's that freedom to kind of remake the world with your own meaning that that is is part of what she's talking about. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And you also um, mentioned that you think that the characters' experiences of literature also bring out some of um, Beauvoir's ideas about literary theory as well. Could you expand on that a bit? Yeah, and actually, as I was thinking about it, when I saw, you know, when I was thinking, I was saying that it was the experiences of literature, but it's really experiences of the arts. Um, I, I've been obsessed for a while, like since I wrote my dissertation, with the first scene in uh, um, and I think it's not incidental that it takes place in a theater. Um, and it's talking about the main character, Francoise, walking through this theater. And as she walks, it's talking about how her consciousness is lighting up the world, right? That like the theater was dark and it didn't really exist before she came there. So it's like the, the her consciousness is kind of like, yeah, lighting up the world. So the, the world 
isn't the same without her light, right? And so that act of lighting up the world is really what is the basis for how she thinks of writing the novel. You're kind of lighting up the world. It's unveiling the world for others. Um, so that that scene I see as being really integral to building her sense of literary theory. Um, and then she also has moments where she talks about other arts, like when she talks about in America, l'Amérique au jour le jour, America day by day, um, she talks about listening to jazz. And she'll talk about the ways in which she watches these jazz musicians who are kind of like pouring themselves out into their music. Um, and they're giving of themselves. There's this idea of the gift that kind of, it, it fits in really well with, um, a lot of ideas about Beauvoir's, you know, philosophy. So they're giving of themselves into this music. And then the listener as well has to kind of give this reciprocal gift to, to really connect with the jazz musician. So they have to pour themselves out too into that, that space that's created by the music. And so there are lots of scenes like that that I'm finding in her novels where she's talking about artistic creation um, that really helped to build this idea of a privileged type of intersubjectivity um, that I think is is integral to her literary theory. Mm -hmm. That was really important what you just brought out there, the idea of reciprocity, because that's such a central mm -hmm. idea for both of thought. And I wonder if it connects back to what Toll was saying earlier about the importance of the reader. So thinking about uh, reciprocity that develops between the reader um, and the writer. And uh, something that um, Torrell said about Beauvoir, that she thinks that Beauvoir is much more optimistic than a lot of her contemporaries about that possibility of, you know, getting that kind of reci reciprocity. I don't know, yeah. um, you were, I think that was one of the questions in Torrell's mind, at least at the time of her writing, was that perhaps Beauvoir underestimated the the risk of being unheard of of not being of not getting that reciprocity from the reader. Well, the, I, I sort of think. Well, I think two things. First of all, I think I got I got to that issue in what Capula uh, literature because I was thinking of there are some fascinating parallels between Beauvoir's understanding of literature and reading and Stanley Cavell's. Now it's quite clear that Beauvoir never read Wittgenstein. I mean, she could have in her spare time, but she never mentions it. So I assume she never read Wittgenstein. And of course, Stanley Cavell may have read some Beauvoir late in his life because he was the supervisor of Nancy Bauer's dissertation on Beauvoir. So that, but there's no sign that he was deeply into Simone de Beauvoir at any point before. So I assume it's a, for me, it's a parallel development, not one of influence. Um, but the, Stanley Cavell thinks of the act of speaking and writing as a kind of, um, invitation to others circulated with the question can here's what i see can you see what i see that's very similar to some of the things that Beauvoir's saying in literature and metaphysics for example but at the same time for cavell this creates an ethical issue for the reader are we making enough of an effort to see what the other sees. And then what he calls acknowledgement is not just sitting there and say, saying, oh, I sort of see it. No, you have to respond, show what you can make of this. And I think that for Cavell, therefore, when he talks about comedy versus tragedy and writes on Shakespearean tragedy and so on, what he is very, um, interested in is what he calls the tragedy of the unacknowledged soul, the soul who receives no acknowledgement. You put out your appeal, you show others what you see, and then there is no response, or maybe there's a rejection. And uh, I think that what I meant to say back then was that Bouwa doesn't 
You see, for Cavell, it is quite possible to be acknowledged, and Beauvoir emphasizes that, but she doesn't really develop the lack of acknowledgement that is uh, crucial if we are to understand why, say, women's voices, Black voices, and so on, sometimes they may well be, like in your case with James Baldwin, if you picture it Beauvoirianly or Cavellianly, Baldwin is positioned it, in a specific space from his own specific trajectory, heavy with its situation and his freedom and so on. And then what he says is like an appeal out into the world. Well, does it find a response that acknowledges what he sees and then builds on it? What I've gotten very fascinated about recently is Beauvoir's Pyrrhus and Sinias. That's thanks to a philosophy student who's now finished a PhD here at Duke, Heather Wallace, who wrote on Pyrrhus and Sinias. I don't think she's published it yet. I give her name in the chat. Um, but my current undergraduates love that text and they love it because there Beauvoir is saying something very interesting, namely, how do I know that my actions have meaning? How do I know that anything I do has any kind of meaning? Well, she answers, first of all, that means she rejects the Camus question in Myth of Sisyphus, which is how does life have meaning? It's no longer a question of it all, it's this action or that action. And she says, well, it needs to have what I could call uptake by others. You depend on what others make of your projects to see what meaning they have. So I find that fascinating. And I think that Beauvoir therefore opens up for the kind of thinking Cavell develops about acknowledgement and the lack of it, but she doesn't quite carry it over into her literary theory at that time back in the 1940s. But I think she's she's very interesting in this idea that whatever you do, and that must include writing, you are uttering an appeal to the freedom of others in the world. And for me, that's interesting in relation to Cavell as well. I would say too, I think it's interesting that in La Vite, she's kind of building that idea of like, you know, casting yourself out onto the world or like casting your light onto the world. And she dis she discusses what happens when you invite another into your world, you know, la vite, the, the, the one who's invited in, and that one, re that person rejects you, right? So the, the main yeah. conflict comes from that rejection of, a, of an appeal for unity with the, the younger female character. I don't think it's, it's really, well, it could also be a jealous rivalry for, you know, the affections of the man in the story, but a lot of it too is this appeal to have some kind of unity and that that appeal is is rejected in that novel but then she doesn't really I, I agree with Toral she doesn't really in her literary theory discuss as much what happens when the when the reader might reject the the invitation in um, she does say that some people don't you know some people don't really take up the the call or they you know they don't um they don't have like a good faith response, I think, to the call, something like that. But she doesn't go into it too much. Mm. The whole question of the need for uptake is really important. I know, Toral, you wrote about this in relation to the second sex as well, that um, that whole that need for the uptake. But sometimes, you know, for a woman or members of other oppressed groups, you just don't get that uptake. And so it's really interesting sort of problem for Beauvoir, isn't it? That how do well, you get it? Yeah. And this is where we get back to reciprocity, which I do think is built on the idea in, in Pyrrhus and Sinias that we need others to transcend our actions in order to see what their meaning is, as it were. But then reciprocity would be, I am not just seeing you as an other in that oppressive way that she explains in the second sex, for example, but I am seeing you both as an object as and a subject and you do the same to me and then we can work together and maybe change the world. That is the message she has. So um, 
I do find the idea of reciprocity is sort of very upbeat and promising, but of course she's also saying there's far too little of it. And by 1949, the free woman is only now being born, she says. Um, so yeah, but, but there is that thing about reciprocity therefore has to involve the response to the actions of the others understood as actions of a free subject but also that they respond to your actions as the actions of a free subject and of course the absence of that leads to oppression and a certain kind of solipsistic skepticism you know actually the end of the invité this is where we don't get any question of acknowledgement. She just kills her. <laughs> that's like the, that's, right. just, that's just like Francoise does not really want, she sort of can't deal with others. It's that mm -hmm. pre Pyrrhus and Sinias point, like an, an investigation of solipsistic skepticism, should we call it that? And because that's like, yeah, you wouldn't do that if you had any inkling of what Beauvoir was going to write next. <laughs> yeah, I wonder, I was thinking about that, about the idea of optimism. I'd be curious about how you both thought about this, because you said that in your earlier work, that there's a, an optimism in Beauvoir, but I also think there's this, this other thread of this sort of acceptance of the kind of the failure as well, like the failure of reciprocity or the failure of uptake. And um, and so that, that sort of actually plays an important role in how she thinks about these issues as well. I mean, I think, oh. Um... Yeah, go Ashley, because yeah. failure is crucial to them. I agree with you. Yeah, I, I was thinking about failure as being the, the main theme in Tous les hommes sont mortels, all men are mortal, that like, and, and the failure seems to come from this idea that in order to share a vision, it has to be mine, right? Um, that, that, you know, I want to bring everyone else into me, but I don't want to make room for their difference. And that's kind of the, the main character, Fosca, that seems to be what he wants to do. And he keeps expanding out into the world, like the, the territory that he wants to have dominion over, right? He's starting with his small little principality in Italy, and then and it moves out to Italy as a whole, and then Europe and the world. And he just can't seem to get um, anyone to, to he, can't, he can't get it to be that it's only his vision and everyone else gets subsumed into that. And then what he ends up with after that is kind of this, this feeling of being alive while already being dead. And um, I think that there's a strong um, connection between that and what Beauvoir will call like dead literature, right? It's something where it's really trying to force onto you a certain perspective that's preconceived and it's already uh, in the works um, that, you know, if, if the author really isn't giving you that freedom in that space, then it's not really literature that's working in the way that literature should. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think when I'm listening to this conversation, I'm sort of really more, I'm seeing even more clearly than before that Boba really does offer us an alternative to a certain kind of identity politics. I mean, <laughs> because she couldn't be an identity politician because it was 1949 when she wrote The Second Sex and it hadn't really been invented. So she's a universalist in the sense of, you know, freedom, equality, solidarity and all that, it's what we need. But what I mean about identity politics now is that we can, this I, the F, the idea that we can only relate to and respond to people who are like ourselves uh, based on some identity criterion, whichever one it is. I think she's phenomenally strong in showing that that just isn't even philosophically an interesting position. And so, and obviously we must, if we believe that then you would end up with exactly the opposite of the vision of the second sex, which is that uh, sexism 
patriarchal myths of femininity have segregated men and women, produced them as different subjects, but the goal has to be work and struggle together, solidarité, or what she calls fraternité in the last word of the text, but um, and I feel that there's so much more to be gotten out of that vision and that we need it now. And uh, what I'm hearing now is it actually is her literary theory as well. Listen to the voice of the other. Try to take up the position she speaks from. Try to see what she sees. Then see if you can respond. And then you will have had what she calls the taste of another life. Not You haven't become them. You are very different, but you will possibly understand something that the world can look different than it looks to you. And unless we can do that, what can we do if we could never break open our own shell? That would be pretty horrible. Yeah, and if we can't, if we say that we can't do that, it also shuts down the conversation, right? Like that my students who say I couldn't possibly understand, that just blocks a really, you know, a strong engagement in the text itself. Um, and, and it's, I find it to be ironic because I think a lot of them think they're being respectful, like, oh, well, you know, because I'm so privileged, I couldn't possibly understand, but it's still exoticizing Black writers to be to the point where like, oh, I couldn't possibly understand that human experience and also shutting down the conversation about this text and about the questions that it's bringing up. Mm. Yeah, I think that's an incredibly important point. And actually, I was going to one of the last questions I was going to ask was about what do you think Beauvoir's legacy for uh, literary theory is? But I think that Toral has already really answered that question. Well, thank and, you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know if you want to say a couple more thoughts about that, but it's almost time where we can open up the dialogue to questions from the rest of the group. Was well, there I'd anything love, else? I'd love to hear questions. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. Well, um, yeah, let's open up to that section of the um, discussion today. So if anyone would like to ask a question or otherwise put something in the chat. And I can see that um, Dennis Gilbert has his um, hand up. So that's a, it is an easy way to do that. It, actually, if you just use a little uh, reaction symbol and put your hand in there, because it's easy for me to see on the screen. So perhaps Dennis, you could start us off with that. Okay, thank you very much. I, um, I'm very much interested in the discussion that uh, uh, that we are having. And I wanted to uh, talk about a text that, a literary text that no one seems to talk about. It's kind of like the, the uh, forgotten novel of Beauvoir, and that is The Blood of Others. Uh, uh -huh. And I don't want to talk about it as philosophy. I don't want to talk about it as politics. I want to talk about it as literary theory, uh, a fictional work that is so far ahead of its time that um, it makes a text by Robe Grier or Boutor, it, it resembles uh, a text by pretty much any one of the new novelists. And it never really gets analyzed carefully enough because it is a very difficult text. And it goes along with everything that everybody is saying about the reader and the writer. And um, I wanted to begin, if you don't mind, with uh, a point that Ashley made with regard to dead literature. And I think to really understand, to really get a good grip on the blood of others, you need to go back and read any first chapter by Balzac. And you, in Balzac's novels, you have a description of the time period, a description of the um, uh, landscape, a description of the house, a description of the characters, who was married to whom, the whole lineage, and then finally, 50 pages into the novel, you meet your main character. The, it appears to me in, my, in reading The Blood of Others, and it happens every time that I read it, that Beauvoir has looked at those, that any one of Balzac's 19th century novels and said, no, this is not how I am going to write a novel. The reader should not be given everything so that the reader can fall asleep and wake up and say, oh, that's okay, I can go back and get 
I, uh, the, the author has given me everything that I need. And um, when you open up the blood of others, uh, there are so many things that necessitate you to be on as much caffeine as possible in order to read through it, because things change at, a, at the drop of a hat. In the beginning of the novel, you don't know who these characters are. You don't really know where they are. You don't know what the time period is. You don't know the difference between present, past, and future. And you don't know, um, one of the things you find out as you read through the novel is that each chapter is devoted to one or the other of the main characters, either Jean Bloma or Hélène Bertrand. However, in the, novel, in the chapters that are related to Bloma, Hélène shows up. In the chapters that, Hélène, that are devoted to Hélène, Jean shows up. What we don't have is what happens in between the chapters. Beauvoir doesn't give that to you. You have to figure out what has happened between chapter one and two. What has happened between chapter two and three? And you figure it out in part by what is said in that particular chapter. But you really have to understand that these interrelated lives are interrelated based upon your, the re, how the reader views how the reader is reading, how the reader is getting through the novel. And in, and, and I would say, if, 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 if I'm sure most of you are familiar with the novel, but reread chapter one of the novel. And in chapter one, in the middle of a paragraph, we're so used to how novels are typed, how they appear, how they look. And usually when there's a change of speaker, the paragraph changes. Well, in The Blood of Others, speakers come and go within the paragraph. There are quotation marks and then quotation marks disappear. Um, there are references to things that haven't happened yet. There are references to things that have happened, but not to the particular character who is speaking. Um, and it is a marvelous, I, I mean, I teach it mostly in English, but I always, when I teach it in French, I say this is the absolute best explication de, uh, model for an explication de text, because you have to really dig into what is going on and she what and the literary theory that comes out of this is that the 19th century novel is dead and for us this idea of the communication between the writer and the reader is absolutely 50 50 and i'm only going to give you part of what i want you to know about this story and the rest of it you have to figure out on your own and you have to fit and, and and when i teach it my students are okay what, hap what just happened there? Because we're so used to the way paragraphs look. And she has completely redone that. And it, it amazes me how um, new novelists kind of blow past her in terms of uh, her importance as, as a novelist. And I think to myself, well, one of the most interesting things would be to read one chapter of Balzac, one chapter of this chapter of The Blood of Others by Beauvoir, and then read any, any initial chapter by either uh, Michel Boutot or Alain Robrier. And I think you will see exactly how far advanced she is. And in terms of literary theory, it's really a, a lot of time, it is in this case, literary theory that is derived from fiction. In other words, she's not telling us anything, she is showing us. And, and as, a re as readers, we really need to be totally engaged because important points of the novel happen without her telling us why. And, and, so, and in one very, very important case toward the end of the novel, we don't even know what happened. However, it is up to us to have to figure, have to figure it all out in order to put it all together. And so that is the way, that is the worldview that she had with regard to writing the novel. And I just think, you know, it is, it's such a wonderful example of her as a literary theorist um, because she's showing us, okay, this is how, this is how novels in, in our case, in terms of the reader and the, the writer and the reader, this is how, this is, this is the result of that communication between the two. And just two other very quick points. So to me, that would be the, to me, that is really her legacy as a literary theorist is, is, uh, is the blood of others. And one thing for, for Ashley as well, since you're working on art, uh, whether the, the, uh, um, uh, the um, appearance or references to art in Beauvoir's work, read chapter one of um, The Blood of Others. And there is a painter named Marcel. And Marcel has a showing. 
And the pages that describe what is happening um, uh, uh, at the showing and the, and the fact that paintings don't come alive until someone actually looks at them. Uh, it is all these things that, well, these are, this is, I don't know, I don't want to say 20 years ahead of its time, but these are things that the existentialists, especially Sapa, Beauvoir, Camus were working on. How do we get works of art to come alive? And they come alive, as, as you pointed out with regard to L'Invité, when you walk into the theater, then the theater comes alive. Otherwise, it's just an inert object. And, 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 and this, these pages are, of uh, uh, Marcel's um, uh, showing are uh, really, I think, will be interesting for you. Thank you. Well, yeah. I, I, oh, go ahead, Tom. No, Ashley, you go ahead, and then I'll add something afterwards. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that Marcel was one of the, you know, when I was saying there are lots of instances in which he's looking at <clears throat> art in music and in theater, um, Marcel is definitely one of those things. And I think, too, I had that same experience as you had in teaching the blood of others to my students, and that it really brought out for me um, how much she was asking of you, as you mm. said. Um, because my students were, they, at first they were totally lost, right? right? They were just like, who is speaking? Where right. am I? What right. is going on? Um, and we had to really, really sit down and dig in and work through it. Um, and they ended up loving it. Again, I think that that, that, that invitation to the reader to really, to really throw themselves into it, um, it, it creates a fun experience. It creates it's an experience that that creates joy for for the reader, um, and and so I, I definitely see that there in the blood of others as well. Yeah, I'd like to say Kevin Spencer, whose camera has now gone dark, so I don't know where they had to leave. I know he's in China, but he wrote a wonderful dissertation here at Duke, where he was looking at the interaction between. First of all, ideas of modernism in American literature and how much they learned from French existentialism. Kevin, I'm talking about your dissertation, <laughs> because the point here is that it's true that there's formal experimentation in the blood of others, but it's also very interesting that, you know, there's been so many, there's there's so much that goes under the name of modernist studies in Anglo-American academia. And yet the term modernisme is almost an anglicism in French and came in much later. And what has happened is that Simone de Beauvoir and Sartre, among others, have not been considered modernist, as you were saying. Um, but they were inspired by Dos Passos, by hard-boiled literature and so on. And I think, Kevin, you could actually say more clearly than I how this experimental aspect of the existentialist actually has been overlooked and not considered. I don't know what they think. I've often heard Sartre and Beauvoir's writing referred to as, oh, Balzacian realism or something, mm -hmm. which that's not what they thought. And it doesn't, it's not what yeah. it looks like, not even L'Invité or anything like that. So Kevin, do you want to say something? I know since you wrote a whole dissertation on it. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, the first thing that came to mind with uh, talking about the blood of others, that was uh, her her Faulkner novel, right? That was, she was using <laughs> Faulkner, the, the, the Sound and the Fury was her, was her sort of model for how to do this. But as I said, also Dos Passos, and, and especially the USA trilogy, where you get these different perspectives and these stories slowly intersect with each other, but it never coalesces into anything like a resolved plot. Um, but so that's part of it. But I think so when what they what she and Sartre and people in their circles found in American literature was a really refreshing alternative to what they thought were these dead ends happening in, in French literature, which was the dead ends being these uh, well, one of them being Moriac, so finding, you know, characters that have no freedom, right? That was the famous Sartre Moriac essay that he's, he's told you in advance the fate of his character. Um, but also these these uh, novels about um, bourgeois subjectivity, where it's just somebody redoing Proust and and um, just just get just you know thinking about memories and thinking about art, but it's totally disengaged from the world. And so they they really liked. That American fiction they thought was mounting a, a critique of American capitalism, 
uh, which I mean, partly I think that's just to be the right sort of political faction for them. But I think also that was a, an attempt to show that it was literature that was dealing with its age, that it was trying to comment on, on what's happening in the world. And so back to Blood of Others then, I think you do see that that element comes out of the Dos Passos, about especially uh, if I think of uh, Dos Passos is 1919, right? Sartre has that, that essay from 1938 on that. And that was his essay of here's how you write about uh, the end of the war in America. And that was his model for the reprieve. And you can see Beauvoir doing something kind of similar with that. She's, she's trying to sort of write about how do you write about the here and now or maybe the three years before here and now or something like that. So, uh, uh, yeah, I just think that's so fascinating because I did know, we know from the memoirs that they read a lot of American literature and went to the movies and saw American movies as well. But it's a very, it's, I think it's really amazing the way you can sort of point to the actual web. I mean, you've, you've done all the work and to see what the influences are in that way is, is really great. But the other thing I was thinking of is, it's, I think it's because they pers persist in wanting to have a social and make their novels a social and historical intervention. I mean, after the 1940 occupation in the 30s, not quite the same, but so that then it doesn't look modernist anymore, because if we allow, if we think modernism whether in America or in France, it's just formal experimentation, we also tend to think, well, okay, then it can't be about history and politics, it can't have characters and so on. So we, we, we tend to, I mean, I'm not agreeing with that view, but it's been very widespread in literary criticism that you get oh, either I write about the form, and then that's the point, or, uh, okay, I read this as a thematic thing where they intervene, and then it's formally unexciting. And I think you, Kevin, you bring out the fact that the two go together for, for Sartre and Beauvoir. Yeah, and then just the last thing I'll say on that is that it's that line that always struck me in, in Sartre's essay of the, the situation of the writer in 1947, where he says something along the lines of um, something like we were converted to dogmatic realism by way of absolute subjectivism, but he uses the phrase dogmatic realism. And it was such a striking thing to hear a writer saying in 1947, but that was, that was exactly it, I think, is that it was his reaction to what we would now call a kind of modernism, but like, but they are, they are also doing a kind of modernism, but as they say, it's like a modernism that's trying to be historically uh, engaged and you know. Yeah, I, I think that in The Blood of Others, it even goes together the formal experimentation and what she's trying to do in that novel, at least in my reading of what she's trying to do in that novel, which is kind of create this picture of their world as being interconnected and um, really as being separate but interconnected, right? So when she's in a point of view, she has to be in that point of view and you can't know things that are outside of it. They, they, I think the existentialists talked a lot when I was reading some of their stuff about admiring the Americans for kind of not floating between different subjectivities and knowing everything and being omniscient in that way, but really sticking to what that one point of view would know but she'll go from one to the other. So she's kind of showing them as being interconnected. Um, so she's creating that sense of being both separate and connected at the same time through the form of the novel. Um, yeah, just one more thing that, that I thought was interesting in that is I'm thinking too of um, Paul Nizan, what at his, so, so the sort of promising, voice on the, in the communist front who was killed in the war, early in the war. Uh, but he, and it starts, you know, close friends since boyhood, so he's in the, in the same circle to some extent. But, you know, his novel, uh, is it called The Student? Is that the, is that the right name? Nizan, uh, I can't remember what it's uh, called. Well, anyway, he's got, a, he's got a novel that's his attempt to, it's his proletarian novel, but he never uses a proper name. It's always just, you know, the man, the man, you know, and it's supposed to be the sort of generic figure of the worker. And it's really interesting that in Sartre's Dos Passos essay, he mentions Nizan's novel and he says, well, Dos Passos is also doing this kind of general person of a certain class. But instead of saying like the student, the farmer, whatever, he's just giving them a name and a proper identity. 
and that there you get that you, you start to see how their own specificity intersects with these larger themes that that are sort of shared between people of that station and i think i think Beauvoir is, i think that really uh fits what Beauvoir is saying about this appeal with that thing where it's like i think ashley you mentioned it with this idea is like in order for some for me to share something it has to be mine first like that you have to have a bit of both here you can't just do one or the other um so yeah yeah it's just sort of connected to that yeah and that's the idea of like the the garden you have to cultivate your own garden in Pyrrhus and Cineus and the, so it's starting from there and then moving on from there but yeah Meryl you've got your hand up so yeah uh, yeah, thank you. This is so, uh, it's so great to see everybody and, um, and it's such a good conversation. Um, I wonder if I could ask you to talk a little bit about Les Belles Images. Uh, Be, yeah. because, um, and this is partly selfish because um, I said that I would, uh, I said that I would talk about it uh, in Finland in connection with truth and post-truth and maybe Foucault and, and, and whatever, but, but uh, in, in, in connection with the, um, you know, is, is, that, is that a break? Is it, is it thought as a break or is it thought as a chain? Is, is it a, uh, a shift in, in style in response to um, the world of Talcal? Is it, I, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> kind of one of people's brains about it, you know, and the, and the question of, of um, you know, I mean, we've, we've known for a very long time that both modernism and postmodernism are not helpful concepts. And yet, there's something that we want to talk about that is or was named by those. So I'm just, I'm just curious what, what people think about that. I'll be happy to say, I mean, Le Belles Images is actually a novel that, in, it seems to me that Beauvoir, if you look at her literary texts, they oscillate in that you have L'Invité, which is definitely, as Kevin says, inspired by the Americans in having point of view chapters, but it's pretty straightforward. Then come Le Belles Images, which as, uh, is totally correctly pointed out, it's much more formally experimental. But then, uh, so, sorry, the blood of others is formally experimental. I'm not sure what I think about the form of Tous les hommes sont mortels, though. I mean, Ashley, you seem to have that on your fingertip, so maybe you can chop in there. But then we get to the mandarins. I, I, I worked quite a lot on it at some point. I wrote a paper on it not too many years ago. And uh, the, the thing about the mandarins is that it still has the point of view chapters, but it's really doing what Kevin is saying, trying to grasp a moment of political change and turmoil in a way that's not that formalistic in any way whatsoever. And then interweaving that with questions of love and sex and so on. Um, so, and then there's this long gap in which she writes memoirs. And so then when we get to Le Belles Images and La Femme Rompue, I always think that there you have like the two sides again. I mean, like Le Belles Images more like the blood of others and La Femme Rompue a bit more like say some mixture of L'Invité and the Mandarins. But, it, but actually, no, I take that back because it, I forgot about I was thinking of the diary fragments in the title story, but you have that very intense monologue, which is very sort of stream of consciousness modernist. So you could say that. So then what would I say to Merrill? <laughs> I would say that the 60s text 
pick up on stuff that she had been doing already in the blood of others and her early books, but maybe pushes it a bit further. That, that would be to be established, as it were, by reading them properly. But none of these texts are what one would call hermetic or really that hard to read uh, compared to what, <laughs> at the same time, you, you know, she was... As you know, La Femme Rompue called, you know, literature pour midinette, uh, roman à l'eau de rose and all that, um, because it was about women and had appeared in L. So if there is modernism there, which I think there is, they're not exactly, it's not exactly clear to all readers. So there's something there to pick up on. Was the reception of Le Belles Images more aware of its formal constructions than, say, the reception of La Femme Rompue? That's worth looking at. Yeah. Well, maybe Maureen can, can speak to the question of reception because, um, well, I don't know if you want, if you want to, but... Um, Marine has posted a very interesting connection yeah. to, so we have to, uh, there's a dissertation that has something there. Interesting. Yes, I shared a dissertation by um, a French scholar, Bobo scholar, and she is interested in uh, literary theory in, and the, the um, transformation of Beauvoir's uh, conception of writing novels from the novels of the 40s and Les Belles Images and La Femme Rompue, and it's very fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and on the question oh, of- Yeah, uh, is this available publicly? Can anyone read it or? Yeah, you can uh, click on the link and then you have accès en ligne, access online. Okay. And you have access to the, the whole uh, dissertation and it oh, is yes. a very, very interesting dissertation on uh, this topic. I think you might find it very interesting. Fascinating. Okay. On the subject of reception, um, well, I, I, I read the letters that Simone de Beauvoir received from her readers and um, there is a shift in the reception when Les Belles Images are, is published because uh, the readers are very um, surprised by the formal, um, you know, the, the form of the, the, the novel because it's not, that, it's not what they are used to read from Beauvoir and they all write that it's not Beauvoir, uh, it, it's not, um, they, they do not recognize her in this um, book. So yes, and it's the same for, La Femme Rompue, but it, it's uh, much more um, the case for Les Belles Images. But uh, yeah, it, it is interesting to see the shift uh, from 1966 in the reception. I did feel when, I, you know, if, if, the, if one of her major questions is this question of communication and where we meet each other, I felt like in Les Belles Images, there's this question of how we meet each other through like conventional, you know, I, I'm looking for the right word here, like products that are out in the world that are made for mass consumption or, you know, like publicité, those kinds of things, like something about that like space that's more it's supposed to be communication, but it's more emptied of a, an individual subjectivity in that novel. Other questions? Oh yeah, Jennifer, you've got your hand up. Lovely to see you. Hi. Hi. Yes, this is this is such a wonderful discussion and about all of these aspects of Beauvoir's oeuvre that I feel like we don't talk enough about. Um, and I wanted to ask about, I guess, falling on other questions kind of about Beauvoir in the 20th century novel and specifically about how you might read Beauvoir in relation to the genres of autofiction and then more recently auto philosophy because I mean I've taken when I was in grad school in, in French literature I took a class on autofiction and we read Modiano and you know it it seemed like a very masculine genre to me and now we're doing auto philosophy building on Wittgenstein and 
um, Nietzsche, and again, feeling like a very masculine genre to me. So on the one hand, when I have these conversations with, with people working in these areas, I wanna say, well, Beauvoir is so relevant to this conversation because of the way she wrote. But on the other hand, I kind of hesitate to say that she's doing auto philosophy because there's something different about the way she's doing it versus uh, Nietzsche, for example. Well, hmm. So I'm very interested in auto fiction, but I've, first of all, I think it's still very unclear what exactly people mean when they say auto fiction. It's by no means a settled term. And of course, the, the, the great precursor in French for me, well, you can't get around Dubrovsky, but if you, <laughs> I can't say. I, yeah, don't let, get me started on Dubrovsky, but there are issues with masculinity, sexuality, and a kind of sense that if you open, say, um, An Amour de Soi, right from page one, you, if like my totem figure for autofiction is Knausko, obviously for nationalist reasons, but, <laughs> but the thing is, um, you couldn't have two more different kinds of writing. In Dubrovsky, it's right from page one, so clear that this man is trying to write beautifully. He's trying to write this beautiful French prose. And Knausko, apart for the first five pages, he says, I wrote those to show I could write modernist prose, and the rest is as raw as possible. So Dubrovsky is turning his life into modernist prose. Knausko is trying to grasp reality as in its as raw state as possible. And those two projects are just totally different. And yet you get both of them labeled autofiction. So the result then is how do we know what to say about Beauvoir? I would say that the second sex has been criticized for decades for being universalizing her own white um, French subjectivity, i.e. taking the particular and universalizing it. That's always been a critique. Now, I totally disagree with that. But if you look at what people are saying about what you call auto philosophy, and over in my corners of literary theory, people talk about auto theory, say Maggie Nelson or something like that. Um, then you will see that they are not criticizing people for using their own experiences to build an argument. So I don't think I want to say, I think of the second sex, we struggled so long and so hard to have it accepted as philosophy. And I don't think that struggle is over, but I mean, that was hard. Secondly, um, I mean, someone like, well, Sonia, I mean, you, how long since you wrote about the situation? We've been struggling ever since to get that book accepted as, as philosophy. But at the same time, then the concept of philosophy that people then bring to it is one in which the personal is supposed to be absent, which runs counter to her whole project, right? Which is, I from that beginning. It has often happened to me that a man says to me in an abstract conversation, you say that because you're a woman. And then she says, I know that my only hope is to say, I say it because it's true, but then I have to eliminate my subjectivity and he doesn't essentially. And so I think that's essentially I'm waffling on, but what I want to say is, I think there's a really interesting case for looking again at the second sex in the light of what we now call auto theory or auto philosophy. And then maybe once and for all kill that idea that she's universalizing her own position. No one's, uh, of course she's writing from the position she's in. We have to do that. What other, there's no other way. At least not if you're at all phenomenologically uh, inclined. So, uh, so that's all I can say. I think it's. A, I think that's a great research topic there. Yeah, fantastic questions. 
I think, Lorraine, do we need to move on to the next um, section of our program? Uh, if there are no other questions, we can. If uh, there are no other questions, yeah. Conclude the, the session. If, uh... hmm. yeah. I just have to say hello to that lovely cat. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's I great. wish the cat had asked the question. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I would it's like to wonderful. Say, um, sorry from my English, I'm a Brazilian researcher, and I would like to listen more about women that are thinking about uh, literature and reviewing this concept and uh, their responsibility to, to think about uh, Simone de Beauvoir as a uh, literary theorist. Do you know? I would know to listen more about it. it, it Ashley, maybe you can, but your question is, are you are you asking whether women interested in Beauvoir should consider her as a literary theorist or whether that's necessary or whether one can sort of should that move past it? the challenge to think about women that are thinking about uh, uh, literature theory and uh, you as a researcher and mm -hmm. uh, Simone de Beauvoir as a literary theory. Right. I think if you are saying what I think you're saying, you're saying that putting all those things together, we end up with a real danger of being totally marginalized because you are working on Beauvoir, which is still not that unfortunately everywhere accepted, although it's getting better. Then you're speaking as a woman and then you want to say that this woman has thing to say about literary theory and reading that is relevant, not just for women, but for all. And I mean, that's a tall order, don't you think, Ashley? It's hard, maybe, but it's also ambitious. And I think women will be heard if they're ambitious. Yeah, I, I agree. And I do think in, in my work, I've been slightly frustrated with people who don't, well, not, not with, with the tendency to kind of say whenever she's writing a literary text, that it's just to say, something about philosophy that it's not that she's 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 just kind of wrapped the philosophical idea in a pretty literary package and that that there's no reason for her to have chosen literature and I think that there's kind of a gendered dynamic there that like women will write the literature and men will write the philosophy and so we want to claim the philosophy for her because she's been you know they they they've kept her out of it out of a, like kind of a sexist impulse they've kept her out of the philosophy realm but I think that for her literature has a value in it in of itself that she wants to claim. Um, and so, you know, you are getting kind of into sticky waters there. I think that I, I don't want to deny, I definitely do not want to deny her philosophical originality. But I think that like, when we say that she's just writing the, the literature, literary text to write philosophy, we're doing something that's um, not doing justice to her actual project. And, and there, there are gender dynamics there when you're kind of you know, putting the literature below the, the philosophical um, enterprise. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Do you, did you mean, Ashley, that we need to sort of have a sense of the distinction and not try and put all of Beauvoir's work together and say some of it is philosophy, some of it is literature, and we don't want to sort of just completely flatten all those distinctions? Yeah, I mean, I think that what, what I'm trying to say is that if we say that all of her literary works are just philosophy in disguise, um, that we're, and that, you know, philosophy is clearly this, this higher pursuit, um, that we're kind of playing into gendered stereotypes about who does philosophy and who does, who writes literary works, and, and mm -hmm. that we're kind of putting down, but I think that the literary text for her it has philosophical possibilities, but it's it's valuable in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is a danger. Thanks, Marcel. And then um, Meryl, you have another question. Great. Well, I just wanted to to agree with that. You know, it's it's been so important to undo the marginalization of her as a philosopher and to say, oh, no, she is, she is, she is, she is. Um, 
But, you know, not to be a philosopher is not the worst thing in life. A number of us have survived it. <laughs> you know, if, if you ask me, do you want to write philosophy or would you like to win the Goncourt for your novel? You know, it's, it's not obvious. It's not obvious what, what, you, would, what you would choose. So, um, yeah. I agree with you, Meryl, completely and with Ashley, but it's also true that the problem with the philosopher and Beauvoir, as I agree with every word Ashley said about the validation and so on, but it's also true that because she had a relationship to Sartre, if she was trying to go for philosophy, then it was written up that like Simone de Beauvoir, disciple de Sartre, right? So then you can't, so then she becomes second to Sartre, whatever she does. And I mean, it's not clear to me that Sartre could have written the second sex, for example. <laughs> so, so, but then on the other hand, to get literary prestige, if you look at the sociology of culture of, of France in that period, I mean, how many prestigious women writers were there? A Colette, who was still alive, I think. But if you look at, you know, the Palmares, the list of great canonical writers back in that period, very few women. And um, so obviously to, make it as a major writer is we should appreciate that too but what happens is the philosophers think she's too personal and literary and the literary people think she's not modernist and formalist enough so therefore the, the, there's a little sense that okay le goncourt for the mandarins but you know it's a big roman a clé, and uh, that, that's all it is so, so, uh, but but that only goes to prove what she says in the second sex that the whole point under patriarchy is that whatever a woman does, she will put be put in the wrong somehow. It's the man who is right. It's he who it's and she is in the wrong by virtue of speaking with the voice of a woman. Yes, so true. Are there other questions? Possibly not. Yeah, maybe we oh, can. Actually, oh. I have one more question if I can ask. Yeah. Uh, this is, it might be too much, but it's something It came up in the, from, from what both Toral and Ashley were talking about before. And it's this idea of the appeal and, a, a very closely related concept that <clears throat> I'm trying to get my own hands around, which is disclosure, right? this unveiling, right? the, the déboilé. And I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering if you have thoughts on what that is. <laughs> um, I mean, I have my own thoughts about this, but it, it seems like it's such an important concept for for Beauvoir, and it's and as well as for Sartre. You know, they borrowed this word from Heidegger. Um, but I, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to figure out what what is the difference, for example, between disclosure and representation, right, in a, in, in a literary work? Um, so do you have any thoughts about that word specifically? Atoral, you're muted. Uh, yeah, so isn't unveiling and disclosure pretty much the same thing for them? Le dévoilé, or do you mean a different yeah. term? Because, no, I, I mean that word translated. Yeah, I, I think it gets yeah. translated both those ways, and Hazel Barnes translated it as revealing. And, yeah. This disclosure sort of, I think they mean disclosure because that's the translation of Heidegger that you get. But the thing is, um, the unveiling, I don't think it's representation exactly for them it's much more what Ashley was saying this thing that you walk through the world also as a writer and you light up the world in front of you by looking at it and finding words for it you are unveiling it and showing that and that would and for Sartre as you know better than me that's already changing it by naming it you change it but does that have to be representation? 
all depends on how you define re representation, right? It could because if representation, as it is for some people, is anything put into language, but if it means you can unveil things by not, but you don't have to represent reality, I assume. It could be stream of consciousness thinking, it could be, I don't know, it depends on what they mean. Because I have, at the moment, I'm in a phase where I no longer understand what anyone means by representation, because it's become too confusing. I think too, you know, Beauvoir uses a lot of kind of related images to describe that that sense of unveiling or, or disclosure, whatever English word we want to use for divwadi. Um, and all of them kind of have that sense of the world and the subjectivity being melded together in some way, like having the taste of another life. It's like giving the taste to the world. So the taste is part of it. You can't have the food without the taste. You can't separate the two out, um, putting light on something, right? Like you can't really see it without the light. They're not really separable. She uses those kinds of words to talk about it. So for me, it really is kind of remaking the world through seeing it with your own, like with your own meanings and your own perspective and your own um, way of understanding it. There is, a, she keeps talking about remaking the world. Yeah, but that that's sort of that's by finding the language for it. Mm -hmm. You then, but then it, that would have to, in its own way, be an appeal to the other. You you can't get around the fact that anything you put into language isn't just automatically having a critical effect. The reader has to have the uptake, even if Sartre doesn't stress that. That when he talks about the generosity of the reader and so on. But without that idea of the reader collaborating and seeing it, which is different from just plain representation, which is much more empiricist as a concept in that way. I don't know whether that helps. You yeah, look... I think so. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I agree it's a huge question, but uh, we have to begin somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just a word that I'm, well, I'm, I'm trying to sort of steal ideas from you both because it's something I'm trying to work on these days and I can't get my hands around this idea very well, so, yeah. No, it's, it really is very hard. Oh, great, yeah. It's a very good concept, actually, to think about at this point. <laughs> Thank you all. I think we we we're gonna uh, go back to our lives. Maybe. <laughs> Thank you all for uh, this uh, conversation. I, I will share the recording very soon, so people who could not attend can listen to your conversation later. Uh, and I'm sure it will be very very appreciated, as it um, was a fascinating conversation. I mean, I really enjoyed listening to you and I'm sure everyone did so thank you so much uh, to the three of you for this conversation um, thank you Marguerite uh, and Ashley and Toriel maybe um, we will meet again in real life I hope um, I hope so the before we leave I just want to announce the date of the next webinar it will be May 11 uh, it will be a presentation of the two articles that won the Patterson Prize 2021 with the presence of the authors uh, and of Jennifer McQueenie and Claudia Boulean. So make sure you mark the, the your calendar and uh, see you in 10 or 11 days. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ashley and Toro, for your wonderful answers. <laughs> and thank you, Maureen. Bye. Bye.